our presentation and straight away uh, um, uh, what I'll do is now that the announcements are complete, our first presenter is going to be Gregory, who would be uh, it's going to be Gregory who would be talking to us about developing a methodology for cost wash uh, action plans in Corella Hotspot. Uh, Gregor, Gregory, please go ahead and share your uh, presentation. Okay, thank you, Musa. So, Laure, my colleague, will share the presentation right now. Musa, I think I, uh, you need to allow me um, to share. Oh, yeah. great. You are, you are allowed. Can you see? Okay. Yes, we can see. Yes. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good, good morning for, for some of you. Thank you for participating to our session. My name is Gregory Bullitt. I am a WASH specialist for UNICEF. So I'm pleased to present a project um, aiming to develop a methodology to define WASH costed plan for cholera hotspot. The work is still under progress. Uh, so your comments are, well, are welcome. And this is why we have created a poll with three questions and we invite you to answer them. Uh, also, I will have with me two colleagues who will be able to answer your question in the chat box during the presentation. Remy Carcasses from ESA Consultants, uh, who can answer about the project progress, and Jean Godard from Marseille University, who can answer about the risk factors analysis. Finally, Laure Anke, who works with me at UNICEF WASH, uh, will help answering any remaining question at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So why this project? Uh, despite many years of fight against cholera, there is not a standard methodology or approach to define a WASH plan. And one recurrent criticism is that WASH plans are often too generic and costly. Um, so plans are therefore not specific enough, not addressing enough the most likely causes of the disease persistence in hotspots, and by not addressing the root causes, it often results in low impact and donor fatigue, as we can see often, um, including uh, enduring domestic resources allocation. Next slide, please. So the, the question is therefore about finding a simple methodology replicable to a broad variety of, of context um, allowing to both identifying the main likely causes and to transform these into realistic and wash, uh, realistic wash costed plan. Uh, so here we are proposing a methodology to, prior to prioritize those main risks, to identify and cost the key actions. Um, to do so, we have identified three conditions. First one to be simple enough, so it can be replicated. Uh, second one, to use only free software, free software, and of course, target key actions, uh, so to reduce the financial burden. Um, and also, we have identified some prerequisites, uh, like having access to anonymized line listing, which is um, mandatory, and also having access or producing a WASH baseline. Next slide, please. So the proposed approach is comprised it's comprised of conventional phases, um, first a literature review, field data collection, and prioritization of action for costing. Um, however, our literature review revealed a gap in standard methodology regarding every uh, stage of the development of costed plan. So we do not have a standard methodology to collect the data, both secondary and primary, and we don't have a standard approach to uh, define how to use those data to, uh, to cost the key actions. Next slide, please. So we have tested the proposed methodology in Goma, uh, the Air Congo, applying those, uh, those three phases. And uh, during the first phase of secondary data analysis, we propose a spatial analysis of the line listing, uh, which we consider a critical step in the identification of key actions. In Goma, for instance, while the, the whole city is identified as a hotspot, 
Uh, if we look in the, into the line listing, we see that about 70% of the cases occurred in only six health zones among uh, or out of the 28 of the city. So why those uh, six areas in particular? Well, at this stage, we don't know. Um, and this is why uh, we need uh, this methodology to focus the data collection in those areas to try having a better understanding of the main transmission routes, uh, causes, sorry. Next slide, please. The literature review stage also provides some first element of response, of course. And we can see here uh, that not all health zones have the same access to pipe torture services. And that overall, the quantity available through water distribution systems, uh, and it can be through water trucking or bicycle or pipe, is around 14 liters per day per person, which is extremely, extremely low. And we have also the confirmation that safe management of excreta in Goma is extremely limited. But again, each neighborhood have different ways of managing excreta and some resulting in higher exposure than other. Next slide, please. So the second phase of the methodology aims to collect complementary data uh, primary data, and also to start co-producing the plan with local stakeholders. Um, the, the methodology as we try it in GOMA took about three weeks and combined different levels of analysis. Uh, we uh, produced both quantitative and qualitative data. So I spare you the, the full picture of the assessment carried out in GOMA, but we will describe in the next slide or the following slide, the main finding uh, of the methodology. Next slide, please. The household survey for data collection uh, was done in 19 neighborhoods. Um, as you can see, 13 of them uh, in, in areas with high persistence of cases and six of them in areas with a low number of cases. Um, so those neighborhoods were identified through the analysis of anonymized line listing and also key informants um, that conf who confirmed the, the line listing data. We used the GMP question uh, completed with context specific ones uh, because for us, one of the objective also is to have those results GMP compatible or at least that those results be compatible with existing national or, or local wash baseline existing. Next slide, please. We also um, undertook uh, other uh, type of data collection activities like commented walks, um, focus group discussion, key informant interview, and also water sample analysis to complement the household survey. Uh, this helped highlighting potential key exposure, like a significant contamination of water sources, which is well known in Goma, uh, but more interesting, uh, the recontamination of water at home uh, that we have kind of uh, demonstrated uh, with, uh, with this survey. And so also meaning a, a hygiene related issue, uh, plus a, a significant issue uh, as, I, as I already said, they are used leading issue. Next slide. Sanitation and hygiene related gaps appear also critical in Goma, and despite being far less documented than water, um, the study really shows a very low level of access to improve or even basic sanitation. With little open, open defecation, open defecation is not the main issue in, in Goma, but, um, but there are numerous latrines, uh, and those toilets are in very poor condition they are often shared by several families and sometimes up, uh, up to 20 families sharing one single toilet. Next slide, please. So here is uh, what we propose in the methodology, uh, try to kind of rank the, 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 main, the main risk factors. So we try to apply a simple statistical analysis while revealing those key wash related risk factors. Uh, we use the result of the household survey 
to try to compare the effect of various types of exposures uh, and then to highlight or confirm observed risk factors uh, by producing odds ratio for each exposure. We voluntarily propose a simple method, a univariate analysis using Excel only, to facilitate its replication. Our objective is that people are able to use that. So of course, such simplified method has many limit limitations, and we, we recognize this, and users need to assume that the goal of this exercise is only to highlight the main risk factors in order to support decision making. Next slide, please. So here, um, at this stage of the methodology, the main risk factors are normal, normally better known, and it is now necessary to propose key action and finally to cause them. So the second part of the project is still under construction and need to be tested uh, on the ground. So all your comments and recommendations are welcome. Again, please answer the poll question. Next slide, please. So we propose a standard template uh, for the costing tool, which will be the final project of this, uh, of this, of this methodology. Uh, to describe the expected resolution, so outcome, output, baseline, and targeted beneficiary, uh, key activities, and also expected time frame for implementation. Um, and then we propose to use a standard bill of quantity that wash actors normally uh, master quite, um, uh, quite regularly, I mean, normally, uh, for each main categories of action to ensure no major cost are uh, or is overlooked. overlooked. Next slide, please. So finally, we have here a sum up, a summary of the proposed actions at the hotspot level, including contingencies if necessary. Um, and we provide also information on funds committed or pledged. Uh, for example, in Goma, 27 million are already identified uh, and available for the water supply system, uh, making sanitation a real urgent priority to fund. Um, and but again, as this work is in progress, we are questioning the level of details that the financial element should uh, display to support appropriate decision making. So what do national and, and local government need in terms of information to decide on domestic resources allocation in polar hotspot? Is the level of details that donors uh, expect? Um, are key information missing here in this, um, in this summary of uh, of financial uh, information. So this is the kind of question, question we are still asking ourselves. Next slide, please. Finally, the, the, the lessons learned from, from the, first, the first pilot in Goma is that uh, we cannot develop a wash costed plan without a wash baseline. So either we have one or we need to produce one. And that both quantitative and qualitative methods are required because they are complementary. So the next step for us will be to incorporate all the feedback that we receive and to undertake a second field test as soon as possible. Next and last slide. So this is the last. Thank you very much for your attention and participation. You can write us um, at those, those emails below. Uh, and I will now ask Remy with, with us uh, to check if there are one or two questions in the chat box that are not responded and maybe we can try to respond. And also, Musa, if you have identified some interesting question to, uh, to answer, we can also try to, to, to answer them. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Gregory, for this um, excellent presentation. Um, there is a question. Uh, we actually are going to have time for about one question. And we actually have a question from now, which says, how many households were included per neighborhood? Was it the same number of the of, of, uh, for high and yeah, low I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? I, I, as I just was in the chat, we got only two questions from John and Anu, and we got one or two minutes left. Okay. Yes. So maybe Busa, you can repeat the question. And this is actually a question for Remy, who has been on, on the project and managing all the household survey. So the question is, uh, how many households were included per neighborhood? And was it the same number for high and low neighborhood? 
So yes, I can answer that. So what we did in Goma is that we focused on around 400 households in the contaminated area in the sub spots, if I can say so. And uh, half of that, which means around 200 in the other areas. And one of the conclusion is that maybe for another test that we are planning to implement, we should, uh, we should do differently. We should double the number of uh, the households surveyed in the, um, in the control area compared to the contaminated area. Maybe I can put the video on, it could be nice. Sorry. Um, I don't think we have enough time. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, but one would say is there are so many questions coming up in the chat. And I request that we could actually take on this conversation later. Uh, you know, Gregory, you could try to respond to some of the questions there. Sure. And also participants, please feel free to post your question in the chat tab um, about the presentation. Um, thank you so much, Gregory, for that excellent presentation. I will look forward to the next step. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. So I uh, will have, uh, then we move to the next presenter and the next presenter would be Alan Ricardo from Action uh, Against Hunger. Uh, he would be talking to us um, about early warning on nutrition and uh, health crisis at Southern Madagascar. Alan, just go ahead and share your presentation. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Alan Patlan and I currently work as an epidemiologist for Action Against Hunger. As well as the project of UNICEF, we are currently doing a, a project of uh, operational research project that it is this one that I'm going to present. And um, we, we are presenting only pre pre preliminary results, however, they're very interesting and they will help us after to build an early warning system uh, in Southern Madagascar. So as well as many other organizations around the world, uh, Action Against Hunger is concerned about the impacts of climate variability on population's health, especially when it comes to the, uh, to the most vulnerable ones, as we are talking about uh, Madagascar. So as we can uh, see, or as we know, climate variability have impact on nutrition and health through different pathways. Some of them are the availability of water resources, food security, and the frequency and distribution of vector-borne diseases. So if we focus on Madagascar, we can observe that this country has the second highest child mortality rate uh, worldwide due to malnutrition, as well as the third uh, highest deaths rate due to nutritional deficiencies. This makes Madagascar the undernutrition one of their public health priorities. So also the Southwest Madagascar, uh, in Southwest Madagascar, the population already faces economic and social issues and is additionally facing negative impacts of the climate variability uh, for, since the last years. And they are impacting their nutrition, the nutritional status and health of their population. Despite these absurd ne negative Im impacts, not only in Madagascar, but also around many other zones around the world, Climate monitoring is still not enough and the evidence produced so far doesn't allow us to fully understand which are the associations between malnutrition and climate. So this evidence gap, or this is why our project aims at assessing the relationship of hydroclimatic monitoring data, as, as well as uh, the nutritional and morbidity indicators, specifically in this case, we're starting a pilot in the district of Betuquiatsimo in order to identify which are the hydroclimatic indicators that can have a, an as, or that have an association with the nutritional and morbidity indicators and describe those significant uh, temporal associations. So as for the methods that we are using, uh, well, we conducted a retrospective observational study based on hydroclimatic and nutritional data from the district uh, Betuquia Timo in southern Madagascar from January 2014 to March 2019. And the hydroclimatic uh, data that we gathered was the monthly pluviometry, monthly piezometric index, and the monthly 
leaf area index, which are uh, collected through the hydroclimatic, well, to the, through the climatic statements that ACF uh, put in place in 2014. And the nutritional data that we gather was the, were the admissions to the Centers for Outpatient Nutritional Rehabilitation of Severe Malnutrition, that are better known as CRENES, and the number of screened children with acute malnutrition. For the data analysis, we assess, assess the relationship of our variables using regression models and cross-correlation functions. Uh, it is important to say here that these methods are the first methods that we are using. However, we are exploring also another methods that can be uh, more adapted or that can better describe the associations, especially because we are going to include another variables that I'm going to mention in the next slides. So as for the preliminary results in the next graphics, we can observe that uh, the data from, we can observe the data from January 2014 to December 2018. In the, up, in the upper graphic, uh, corresponding to the monthly cumulative rainfall, in the middle graphic corresponding to the monthly piezometric index, and in, in the bottom uh, graphic, the monthly admissions to uh, malnutrition treatment centers. As we can observe in, in the graphics for the hydroclimatic variables, we can clearly see that there is a, that there is a seasonal pattern that follows each one of, of the variables, but also that there is a that there is a climate or that there is an interannual variability of each one of the, of the indicators. We can see that in some years we, uh, we have more rain than in other ones, and that gives us like the, the interannual variability. So if we think in the three variables, <coughs> sorry, if we think in the three variables and we consider only our linear relationship, we could say that from those graphics, the increases of the cases of malnutrition, uh, as we can see, correspond with the increases in the uh, hydroclimatic indexes. However, this wouldn't be consistent with the observations that we have from the field, nor with the literature that describes already some of the impacts of uh, a climate on malnutrition. So this is why we hypothesize that there is a plausible lack uh, association between the hydroclimatic uh, indicators and the acute malnutrition occurrence. And uh, this is why we, uh, not, we didn't use only uh, linear functions, but we went further to explore another, another st statistic methods. And as well, uh, this, this hypothesis is the one that will help us like, to understand uh, the better the impacts and to build a more accurate uh, early warning system. So to explore, this, um, to explore this hypothesis or to test this hypothesis, we use cross correlation functions that we perform with data. And as we can see in the graphic, uh, there is a temporal correlation that is plausible. And uh, the number of admissions due to malnutrition were correlated with the decreases in the piezometric index, but two months after, uh, after these decreases happened and not at the same time. So to our knowledge, this would be the first study aiming to assess and characterize the impacts of climate change and in, on undernutrition in, Madag in Madagascar. Uh, these preliminary results that I show you uh, uh, showing a two-month lax import impact uh, sorry, of the hydroclimatic indexes on uh, the frequency of malnutrition are part of a wider study, as I mentioned at the beginning. Which we will perform for we which will perform a more robust analysis, including another factors, which is very important morbidity factors that can play an important role in the pathway to malnutrition, but also the factors or diseases that can be impacted by the climate variability in in this area, in this region. Um, Nevertheless, these preliminary results are consistent with previous study. There are already a lot of well, not a lot. There are already some literature describing the lack impacts of climate on health on different health indicators, um, especially in uh, in diseases like being, uh, malaria, etc. But the evidence on climate and malnutrition, especially in humanitarian contexts, are still scarce. So that is why we're taking this knowledge gap and trying to go further. Based on the available data, as we 
as I mentioned, we could identify a significant, significant negative association between the hydroclimatic indicators and the prevalence of acute malnutrition only in the district of Etiopia Tsimo. This is very important. And also we identified uh, that these associations are lacked or has a lack of two months and doesn't correspond to a linear uh, relationship. So the continuity of this project is very important, as I mentioned, and the research component will help us to enhance the groundwater monitoring and public health surveillance in southern Madagascar, and will also improve the forecasting of health indicators through hydrochromatic surveillance in southwestern Madagascar with a potential replicability in a similar humanitarian context. For this, the next steps for the project are to perform a more robust analysis, as I mentioned, to include also indicators, uh, very importantly, on climate sensitive diseases and complementary hydroclimatic and nutritional indicators, uh, complementary to those that we already have, and uh, to expand uh, the, the research to all the eight districts in southern, south, southwestern Madagascar, and not only as our pilot uh, was performed in the district of Betuki at Simo. So, if you have any questions, they are all welcome. Also, you can write us to, um, uh, well, you can write us regarding any, any other comment that you may have or any input regarding the project or the research. And the floor is yours, Musa. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Alan, for that excellent uh, presentation. So we have a question um, uh, in the chat uh, from Young Willem. Um, and the question is, hold on. We have a question and he wants to know what, um, just hold on. So the question is, what is piezometric index? Could you explain more on that? Yeah, well, the piezometric index are it's measured through piezometric proofs that we installed in Southern Madagascar. The proofs, well, the piezometric index, which it is measuring is the level of groundwater, uh, of, of the groundwater. So which level reaches the, the, the groundwater. That way we can uh, follow uh, the groundwater sources in context where the surface water is scarce or uh, inexistent, or where we need to follow um, the groundwater resources. Right, uh, thank you. Uh, we'll take one more question. Uh, I could see quite uh, some questions there, but I'll take on this. Uh, how would the evidence uh, help field uh, actors to improve their responses to health crisis? Uh, well, uh, at first, this will help to build evidence uh, to, um, well, to build evidence to fill the gap that is uh, currently in knowledge. There are already some knowledge that is, um, that shows the relationship between climate variability or the climate, uh, the hydroclimatic indicators with some diseases, but we will build all, um, more uh, evidence on that. And also how it would help the humanitarian world? Well, if uh, we arrive to identify or to describe which are the lags or for how long is the lag between the increases or decreases in some of the hydroclimatic variables and then how many months or days after will the uh, frequency of any disease will, will arrive, then we will be able to prevent or to be prepared before the, those um, uh, those increases in, 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 in the health indicators or any other uh, production can, can happen. So we will be prepared in advance for, for that. Thank you so much. Um, I know we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, um, I request you to check on these uh, in the, uh, uh, the chat tab and try to respond mm -hmm. to them from different participants. I know someone has just written a question and is actually asking, please, please have this ask but I'll just go and ask this last one. Uh, is it possible that uh, chronic diarrhea diseases are also contributing to malnutrition issues? And that's from Gemma Philip. Yes, actually uh, we started only to, uh, well, we started this project with the wash sector and also with the research uh, sector of Action Against Hunger. 
at the beginning, we were thinking only like in a, in a more simple epidemiological study only to measure, for example, prevalence, incidence, and some associations. But then as, as we also can see that uh, the pathway to malnutrition is not very clear. Well, not that it's not clear, but the, there are a lot of factors that contribute and we cannot understand very well. Uh, that's why we decided to expand this study. And actually that's one of the next variables that we are going to include. Since diarrhea diseases are also impacted by climate variability and water resources, we're going to include that variable as a, a, re, as a response variable, but also to include them as a possible um, uh, effect modifier for, for, for as, a, as a potential uh, cause also for the increases in, in the rates of malnutrition. So yes, uh, diarrheal diseases are very important and we are uh, uh, hoping uh, to include them in a wider analysis, more robust analysis. Right. All right. Thank you so much um, uh, for that excellent presentation. Um, we will now move to our last presenter in this session, and that's going to be Timoth Foster from University of Technology, Sydney. He'll be talking to us about modeling fecal um, pathogen flows and health risks in Dhaka, what it means for sanitation decision making. Uh, to remind you, we have 10 minutes uh, for presentation, uh, and these are followed by five minutes Q&A. And also, I uh, want to let you know that this session is being recorded for folks who could not attend this live session, and everyone but the verbal presenter have been muted. Uh, also, please note that you should type uh, all the questions in the chat tab below, and then we'll be able to actually respond after the presentation. Thank you. Um, Timoth, uh, Tim, can you please go ahead with your Thank you very much, Musa, and, and thank you everyone for, for joining um, the, the um, conference today. Um, so today uh, I'm going to give you um, a whirlwind tour of a research project uh, that developed uh, and applied a systems modelling approach to estimate fecal pathogen flows um, and the associated risks in a low-income neighbourhood in, in Dhaka in Bangladesh. And this project was a collaborative effort between um, University of Technology, Sydney, uh, the International Centre for Diarrheal Disease Research, Bangladesh, and Emory University. Um, and the project was commissioned by Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor um, with some funding from the UK Department for International Development. Um, so in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to present um, an overview of what the study did uh, and summarise some of the key results and insights that it generated. So the starting point for this project is that, um, as you all know, fecal oral infections are a major component of the disease burden in, in low income contexts. And so um, reducing this burden of disease forms a primary justification for sanitation investments. Um, but in urban settings, decision making around sanitation interventions often lacks robust assessment of the extent to which uh, different sanitation options will reduce this health risk. Um, so the premise of this study is that systems modelling can provide a, a valuable tool to inform sanitation decision making, um, and it can do this by predicting pathogen flows and health risks associated with, with different sanitation options. Um, and so we, we, the, 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 the rationale was that it could be a, a very flexible tool that can accommodate great complexity, um, which um, is something that characterises um, low income urban settings. Um, and so some of you may be familiar with uh, a paper by um, Frey Mills and colleagues from 2019, which proposed a systems modelling approach for comparing health impacts of different sanitation options. Um, and her paper laid out a, a framework that, that coupled a, a pathogen fate and transport model with an exposure and risk model. And so this was the framework that um, was the foundation of, of, of this modelling project. Um, and we sought to develop this further and, and apply it in a real world, world setting. So the study site, the real world setting um, that we focused on um, was a low income um, neighborhood in, in Mirpur, Dakar in Bangladesh. Um, and this study site had a population of um, just under 5,000 people. Um, and as you can see from this map here, um, it consisted of uh, four uh, roads running parallel to each other 
And each of those roads had um, one or two open drains running down the length of the road um, with sanitation systems that discharged into that open drain. And so we started off with um, a household survey and, and comprehensive assessment of sanitation infrastructure um, to really understand the hardware that was in place um, and to get some information about um, exposure behaviours and sanitation use um, that would form um, key inputs into the modelling. Um, so about 70% of the population in this study site used toilets that discharged directly to open drains um, and about a quarter of the population used septic tanks, all of which discharged their effluent to the open drains as well. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, the focus of this modelling for this particular study site was very much on, on open drains. Um, previous uh, work by, um, by the Sanipath project in, in Dakar identified open drains as a, a really major pathway for people to be exposed to faecal contamination. Um, and um, as you can see from the photos here of the study site, um, the open drains were um, you know, highly contaminated uh, and people interacted with them on a, on a daily basis. And so this mod modelling was set up to focus on the pathogen flows from sanitation systems into those open drains and then um, how people would become exposed to those pathogens from the open drains. Um, so the uh, framework for the modeling um, is illustrated by this schematic. Um, and so the, the top half of the model um, shows you a, a pathogen fate and transport component of the model, uh, which predicted pathogen concentrations in the open drains and the study sites. Um, and this submodel was, was underpinned by um, a range of different parameters and assumptions related to things like frequency of toilet use, volume of wastewater, disease prevalence, shedding load and duration, log reduction values for sanitation systems, which was key as I'll discuss, um, as well as estimates for, for pathogen die off and, and settling in the drains as well. Um, and some of these inputs were, were deterministic and some of these were um, inputted stochastically. Um, and a lot of the data that we used was, was drawn from the surveys that I mentioned before, but also we had to rely on some, some um, literature often, which was DACA based. Um, the second part of the model, which is in green um, in the bottom half, um, was an exposure and risk uh, submodel. And what this submodel did was take um, the predicted pathogen concentrations from the, the fat and transport model um, and fed them into a um, quantitative microbial risk assessment. Um, so again, this required quite a few different um, uh, inputs and assumptions, particularly around ingestion volume, dose response relationships for specific pathogens, uh, frequency of exposure to open drains um, amongst others. Um, and so the, the, the outputs of this uh, exposure and risk submodel were um, in the form of number of cases of illness per year. Um, and these were then converted to disability adjusted life years. Um, so both, uh, so the modeling um, and as I'll um, describe the environmental sampling um, focused on um, five target pathogens um, and one fecal indicator bacteria. Um, so the three, uh, three of the bacterial pathogens we, we focused on were Shigella, Vibrio cholerae, um, Salmonella typhi, uh, one protozoa, Giardia, um, and one virus uh, being norovirus. Um, and those uh, pathogens were selected um, based on a number of different criteria, um, including the high disease burden that was associated with them in, in Dakar. Um, and in large part, the human specificity as well. Um, so as I mentioned before, a key rationale de for developing a systems modeling approach is, is its ability to uh, assess a variety of sanitation options for a given setting. Um, so for this particular modeling exercise or um, project, we looked at eight different sanitation options, which are laid out here. Um, and, and Within those eight different sanitation options, we looked at both well-managed um, scenarios and poorly managed scenarios. And as you can see here, there's a mix of different technologies from septic tanks um, all, the, all the way through to constructed wetlands. Um, and I won't go into the detail because of time, um, but I'll focus on, on results for a couple uh, of those different options. Um, and, and I guess key to this is that the sanitation options had a um, a major influence in some of the info inputs we put into the model, such as log reduction values um, and uh, exposure frequencies as well. Um, 
given the ultimate output of the model was a health-based measure, um, you know, for example, number of cases, disability adjusted life years, it, it wasn't possible to do a full validation of the modeling um, within the, the time and resources of the project that we had. Um, but what we could do was, was validate the, um, the fate and transport part of the model. Um, so essentially comparing um, modeled or predicted pathogen concentrations in open drains um, with measured path uh, pathogen concentrations. And so there was a, a, a large uh, campaign to, to collect samples from open drains and various other um, parts of the study site to really understand what, what those um, pathogen concentrations were. Um, I won't go into them in detail um, today. Um, suffice to say that there's been a paper recently published which provides some more detail on, on what was found with, in terms of that um, environmental sampling. Um, but for the purpose of the modeling, what we used th those data for were to compare the, um, the modeled concentrations of different pathogens with, with our predicted concentrations. So this, this graph on this slide shows you um, uh, the modeled uh, distributions of, of pathogen concentrations in the drains. Um, so the violin plots, so the light blue um, colors, that, that's the distribution of the modeled um, concentrations for the different pathogens and the uh, and E. coli as well. Um, and what you see with the black dots is the measured concentrations. Um, so uh, as you can see that there's a, there's a, there's a pretty good alignment with um, what we observed in the field and, and what the model um, predicted. And these were based on um, a thousand Monte Carlo simulations. So in terms of the, the results that were modeled um, for, different, for the different sanitation options I showed you before, um, these give you an idea of the, um, the, different, uh, the impact on, on expected disease burden associated with different sanitation options. Um, and, and specifically on the y-axis, we've got um, disability adjusted life years. And these were disability adjusted life years for that local population in our study site um, that arose, that would arise from exposure to fecal pathogens via those open drains. Um, so based on the various assumptions that we had, um, the model predicted um, well-managed options um, would reduce disability adjusted life years by 72 to, a, to 100%, um, while poorly managed options would uh, reduce them between 18 to 91%. And that's relative to the base case, which was essentially the status quo um, situation. Um, so I'll just focus, because there's a lot here and, and um, I don't have time to discuss all of these results. I'll just focus on a couple um, so what we have here is, is option one, which is complete coverage of septic tanks that we modelled, and then option two, which is complete uh, coverage of um, uh, ABR um, systems across, a, across the community. Um, and so septic tanks, we, we predicted, would have a 48 to 72% reduction in, in disease burden, um, and uh, ABRs were slightly um, higher at 67 to 81%. But there are two, two important things to highlight. The first is that when well-managed, there's a concerning health risk. Um, so this is a well-managed system, this is a well-managed system, uh, and this is associated with the effluent discharging directly into the drains. The second is that um, although ABRs and septic tanks are, uh, were assumed to have the same log reduction values, because uh, ABRs involve conveyance of wastewater via enclosed pipes, there's an additional reduction in exposure. We also looked at various scenarios um, and uh, varied up our assumptions to see how that impact, impacted um, uh, our model and the results. Um, and so you can see a few different scenarios here. I, I guess the, the ones to focus in on are the, the long red bars. So flooding at the top um, was uh, expected to have a, a major impact on, on, on the burden of disease associated with those open drains and fecal pathogens, so increasing the disability adjusted life years by an order of magnitude. Um, assumptions around shedding load um, and ingestion um, were also um, highly influential in terms of results. And so um, in, in future, um, getting more robust um, and more robust assumptions and, and confidence in those assumptions would, would, be, um, would be beneficial. Um, there's a range of limitations, obviously, with, with any, any uh, project like this, and I, I won't go to them, into them uh, in great detail. It's suffice to say that um, uh, in relation to model parameters, there are quite a few assumptions and simplifications that needed to be made. Um, the second is that full model, model validation wasn't possible, um, so we could only um, validate the um, bait and transport aspect of this. 
The third is that um, we couldn't quantify downstream health risk associated with pathogens leaving the study site. Um, so we focused just on that study site and obviously pathogens can, can leave that study site and flow to downstream communities. Um, and the fourth is that our particular focus was via pathogen ex uh, for pathogen exposure via open drains. And obviously there are numerous other transmission routes that, that lead to ingestion of fecal pathogens. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish with some implications and conclusions very quickly, but um, to select a few, um, the first is that, you know, systems modeling can be a really flexible approach for evaluating health risks associated with different sanitation options. Um, and, and can be a valuable and customizable tool for informing sanitation decision making. The second is that effluent discharge into open drains from septic tanks um, and ABRs is, is problematic, even when they're well managed. Uh, and this gives rise to a, a concerning health risk. Um, the third is that evidence on log reduction values for septic tanks and, and ABRs is actually quite weak. Um, and we had to make some assumptions and best estimates based on what literature and what was known. Um, but it's a major evidence gap that, that needs to be addressed, um, particularly given how widespread these te sanitation technologies are in, in urban areas. And the fourth um, is that future applications of systems modelling um, would be greatly enhanced by incorporation of um, other transmission routes, um, whilst also uh, quantifying the health risks posed by pathogens exported out of a local area. So I'll, I'll finish there. Um, by thanking the very uh, many colleagues who contributed to this study in, in, in various ways. Um, and thank you for your attention. Um, thank you so much, Tim, for that nice presentation. Uh, we've run out of time, uh, but I will take one question only. I know there are quite a number of questions coming in the chat tab, uh, but we'll actually you know, ask that one question, but you could probably go and catch up with the participants or respond to their questions. So we have a question. Uh, can you please describe a little about selecting uh, the study sites or roads um, in Amilpu? Uh, I can see gaps between road A and B. Was there a reason for that? Yes, that's a, that's a great question and, and very well observed. So th there were, um, I guess, two reasons for that. Um, one of the main criteria for, for where we uh, wanted to focus this work was a diversity of sanitation technologies and systems. Um, and uh, the road that, that you saw to the south, um, which was a bit more separated from the rest of the study site, um, actually had quite a high, high coverage level of septic tanks. Um, one road was about 70%, one road was about 90%. So we decided to include that road because it gave us the ability to understand um, how that div diversity played out in terms of pathogen flows and whether or not, you know, uh, high coverage of septic tanks would, would have any impact. Um, the second reason was that actually one of the roads that was originally included had a, um, a large ABR or a series of ABRs down the, um, down the road. And by the time we um, started the uh, environmental sampling, they were um, dismantling that. And so we had to, um, I guess, pivot quite quickly and, uh, uh, and change the study site slightly. So that's why you see that additional road um, on the southern end. All right, uh, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I think you can have, I think more chats, uh, you know, more uh, questions are coming in. Please take on those questions with other participants. Thank you everyone for uh, joining this session. Um, and now we can move to the next session. We're closing the session, thank you. <laughs>